As you see, this is a little different, the setup, the style, everything. So this will be a little more interactive today. So if you hate talking, you might want to leave now. <laughs> if you don't mind talking, I will please ask those in the back, if you do anything particularly, you need to sit back there, please stay. But if not, please join us. Please. We will have a real fun time today. Now, as you see, it's two sides. Two sides. We have two groups today in our church that you will all play a role with. We have one side who will be the believers, and the other side who will be the unbelievers. We don't know who's who yet. Before I determine that, <laughs> let your mind soak in real quick. Now, last week I spoke about the tabernacle and Christ in it. And today, I want to speak a little bit about how, as believers, as you already know, we live in a tough time right now. And we are being questioned a lot. Things are happening that we are somewhat stuck. I know how to answer somebody. So today's whole sermon will be wrapped around us being able to give an answer. So, in the Bible, there are some very hard things in the Bible. And people who are unbelievers or don't know too much about God have a lot of questions, which are sincere, but they are hard questions. And sometimes the church seems to shy away from those questions, where every day you hear it at work, you hear a bunch of friends, you hear it all the time. And what's happening is we seem to forget that if we don't know how to answer somebody, not perfectly, but give a decent answer at certain questions, we lose people. We lose people. And as believers, what has happened is we are in a place right now where we are being questioned on every single thing. Like a believer will say, I'm against abortion, but that's it. They won't say why, they won't explain what's going on. They will, they will pick it, the abortion clinics, but they will have nothing to say of substance to the unbeliever. So the unbeliever saying, you telling me you don't like this, but that's it, because God says so. That's all they have. And they want more questions, they want more answers. And the unbeliever will say, how do you believe that God that's unseen, you never saw him, but you believe this God? And we say, well, I know he's real, but, and it's this weird thing sometimes because we don't have the right words, and we miss it. So this is the groups. This side, will be the believers. <laughs> and this side will be the unbelievers. You leave it already? You won't get saved? <laughs> I want you to determine. If you want to switch sides right now, you decide. But wherever you are, I want you to speak as if you are that group. If for, if for any instance, you have a statement or a thought that will answer, and that was a question, you can't answer it. I will have Joe, he'll be a floater today, and whatever is said or spoken about will go through the mics so it's recorded. So any question we permitted today, hear me carefully, any question permitted today, but at the same time, if we are stuck at a question that will take too long to answer, we will hold that question and deal with it after the service because I want to get enough time for people to speak and share their hearts. So today will be very different than normal. Before we start though, I want to answer one question particularly in the Bible that had bothered me for years to recently, about a year ago when I received the answer. That's the story of a man we all know pretty well named Uzzah. If you know Uzzah, you know he's the, the person and I tried to stabilize the ark, and God killed them. That's a very hard thing for me for many years. So I always ask God, what did this guy do wrong? His attention seemed right. What happened? What happened? So what's the story? So the Philistines captured the ark and took it back to that land. And they put it in a room <clears throat> next to their god called Dagon. And the very next day, they come back in the room, and Dagon fell over, and the ark is still there. And they said, okay, they put it back up together, they put it back up, and the next day, it happened again, but this time, Dagon is broken in half. His hands fell off, and his head is chopped off. So they're upset, 
that return it back to Israel, say, listen, whatever this thing is, do not time period, they had plagues happen in their land and destroy and kill a lot of them. So they were afraid, they turned the ark back to Jerusalem. And at this time, in Jeru- at Jerusalem, when they met King David and his men in the desert, they brought the ark to them and they put it on an ox cart. And David and his men took the uh, Ark of the Covenant back the same way on the ox cart. And while they were traveling, they hit a little bump. It's a desert, it's rocky, right? And the Ark tilted. And Uzzah wanted to help Reese to stop it from falling, and God struck him dead. And I'm like, God, if anybody deserves grace, <laughs> if anybody deserves <laughs> a second chance, is this guy. He cared for what you care for, his presence. How will you kill him? And I wrestled with this talk for years. Then, as you go to the Bible and read, I remember that God told Israel one way only to move the Ark of the Covenant. How was that? It was to have four priests on four corners with a rod and they would hold it on their shoulders. Why is that important? When you're moving through a tough terrain, like desert-like, and you see bumps and rolls and rocks, if you're on an ox cart, you can't really determine or have a shock absorber to absorb what's about to happen, do you? But if you have four men, which now you have how many eyes with four men? You have eight eyes. You can see in advance, look and see things and prepare in advance for what's gonna happen. And if you see a rock, you can move over it you can step up, if you stumble, you can balance yourself and you will cast the presence of God. But now they had it in their cart. They were fine with it. You know what that was the problem? Because God told Israel one way. One way you move my presence is by four men that represented the corporate man, the body of Christ. We hold them together, not on some cart. So God used, that, God used that one situation to discipline man and to tell them, this is the wrong way to move my presence. That's harsh. But when you understand the reasons behind it, the background, you will almost take it a little easier because now you see what the purpose was behind it. So today is very simple. Very simple. The point is that we will be able today to hear each other speak and also ask those questions that you also want to ask but if I had the platform to do it, this is today. This is today. And I have questions set for myself that if it gets quiet and stale and boring, I have my own questions. And I will ask each particular group. And at those moments, you will decide, talk about them amongst each other, and whoever wants to answer gets the mic and the answer. And we'll go back and forth. Back and forth. It'll be a fun day today. So once again, if you want to leave, this is the time. If not, I will call you out if you are here. Okay. Let's go. So at any moment, at any point, anybody could ask any question to the opposite group. Don't forget, you had the unbelievers on this side, and on this side you had the believers. So those who are the believers, woo, yeah, it might get a little tough today. (laughs) It really might, I don't know. (laughs) But look at this, look look at these sinners. Look, Look at them. Oh man, they, they can't wait to abuse you in every way they can. They just can't wait. <laughs> the one in the back, right? <laughs> so at any point, you can start. If not, I have a question to warm it up, to start it up. So before I start my question, I'll give you a chance to speak to each other. Mm hmm. <laughs> Okay, I want to know why I have to give money. It makes no sense to me. What do you need with the money? What are you going to do with it? Yeah, and this tithing thing, I'm all confused. (laughs) So the question is about tithing. Why do you have to give money? So believers, please, have fun. You have an answer? Oh, you can decide or not. You can speak for yourself or speak for the group. It's on you. Okay, so I'll speak for myself, and the group can decide to kick me out of here. (laughs) (laughs) 
for me, tithing is not about giving money. It's about showing my trust and showing that and my appreciation. So if I have a problem giving my money, then my money has now become my focus. But if my focus is on him and my trust is on him, and I'm appreciative of how far he's taken me this point, the money is nothing but a sign of me giving my trust. And so I have no problem giving that because I know he'll take care of me no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No? Anybody that's questions at the moment. If you have never seen Christ, why do you believe? <laughs> I look at it this way. Have you ever seen the wind? Does it exist? You can feel it maybe blowing. You might see it turning up the, the leaves on the, the ground. Yet people know that it's there. So although you can't see the wind, although you can't reach out and touch it, it's not something tangible. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel about Christ. Although I actually can feel Christ in my heart, mm -hmm. unlike the wind. Mm -hmm. Ooh wee! <laughs> yes. There are times when we have doubts and fears in our minds, but God has a way of, of giving us words of assurance. Mm -hmm. Take for instance, you have something pressing, and you have a pressing and immediate problem, and you're wondering, how will it work out? Mm -hmm. And my answer is this. Somebody sent me a, 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 a text on WhatsApp, and it says, those who leave everything in God's hands can best see God's hands in everything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's natural to worry, but God has a way of giving us that answer in the right time. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I think you got to move, though. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> you may need to move, but... <laughs> Oh, wait. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up. Not done yet. Why do we worry instead of praying? <laughs> Mr. Horace has been kicked off the island. I think he saved that. <laughs> oh, man. As Christians, you guys always tell me that God loves me just as I am. So why do you expect me to change? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Somebody. Anybody. <laughs> Anybody. <laughs> there you go. Uh, ultimately, God would like you to change for your benefit, actually. Uh, you don't do God any favors by changing. Um, he already loves you. He's already offered to save you. He's already sacrificed his son for your sins. And nothing you ever do uh, will uh, make up for, for anything you, you haven't done or failed to do. Uh, but God knows what's best for you. And he would have you change for your benefit, not for his. There you go, Sean. There you go. Can I add? Can you what? Can I add oh, to that? Add. I just want to add one an apology because I shouldn't expect you to have to change. I just see the different changes I went through and I'm happy for you in advance. Mm. That's one. And then two, I sh again don't want you to change. God, like he said, knows what you need, and I'm waiting for the change. So sometimes I may get ahead of myself, and I may pressure you to change, but that's something God needs to do for you and in you. 
So. That's right. Good night. Thank you. Okay, so I have a question. Um, a lot of the stories and scriptures in the Bible seems to be a little far-fetched on how it's this depicted upon. So I want to know how could they document everything and claim that Jesus did this or Moses did this and David and all these other people in the Bible. How are these stories all actuality if it was never written down and it was like ages AD, I mean BC before Christ. So how is it actually in the Bible itself now? Lifeline. <laughs> Listen, guys, I, I'm only here as a last resort. <laughs> So I'm going to give anybody a chance to jump in. <laughs> Sean, you, you're so good, Sean. That's our stand close. I might just be a glutton for punishment, so I'll let, I'll let, I'll let you give the real answer after this. Uh, in, the old, in the Old Testament, as it was just uh, for anybody who was alive back then, uh, any group or any tribe, they would just have oral traditions. They would pass the stories down. Um, things were written down in some fashion. God wrote the uh, Ten Commandments on a piece of rock, for instance, but they, they had things that they carried around the Ark of the Covenant. But most of the stories were passed on. The unbeliever, I'm sure, would say, how do they know they got it all right and all this other stuff. Um, that's part of where trust comes in and trusting that God is real. Um, there's a long history in the Old Testament of promises, um, especially about the Messiah and all that. And then when Jesus came along and fulfilled a lot of that, this is sort of how we know that the other stuff that God said is true is true because he gave us a, a record um, and then he proved it. And then so anything else that goes back to what it says God said, God said this or this thus declares the Lord we're in the same way that we trust that the stuff that Jesus said is, or did was true. Um, we will have to go back and trust that that's true. Some of it is wild. Uh, the Bible is not for the faint of heart. It is scandalous in a lot of times, and it is, it is rough. It's hard to understand, um, but we're not, I don't think we're expected to fully understand everything all the time, um, but a lot of it is trust. Mm -hmm. But if you don't trust, uh, you've got to put your trust in something else, and I would ask what your trust is in right now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent answer. Uh, I just want to kind of add to that that uh, oral tradition is a real part of particular, particularly Judaism. Um, in the West, we don't do that. We write everything down. But in, in the East, they trusted oral tradition. I would tell my children, my children would tell their children, and it would go on from generation to generation. In addition to that, uh, we have found that archaeology has proven every story of the Bible, even the far-fetched ones. So the study of archaeology, the discipline of archaeology, uh, they've dug down into the soil in Israel and other places, and what they said has been proven by um, things that are written down, actually. I have a number of books in my library that are secular books that document and support mm -hmm. biblical stories. Mm -hmm. So if it says it, you can trust it. Uh, Yeah, see, so archaeologists have proven it. Uh, the book of Joshua says that they blew the trumpets and the walls of Jericho fell down. They fell into each other. And that seems far-fetched because you think they would fall out from each other. But the archaeologist has proven that they actually imploded. The walls of Jericho actually imploded and came right down inside the city itself. So... Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, of course, is the Bible says God inspired. Every word of God is inspired. That word means God breathed. <sighs> mm -hmm. So when you open up your Bible, it's the God breathed word. Mm -hmm. it's very, you, you can trust it. It's protected. 66 different authors over a couple thousand years. Yeah, it's all good. It's all proven. Mm -hmm. Let me ask that real quick. Let me ask that real quick. Um, so the person just put together this nice little Especially since for us so far. I mean, imagine that it is said that the Bible is written, like the pastor said, thousands of years. They come together and they write this stuff and they all seem to line up in a weird, seamless way. 
and read through the Bible. There's stories of the Bible that uh, Sean says is prophecies that came through. We came to see it in our time and those before us. For example, we mentioned in Daniel about a young he goat that will rise up the power real quick and he will suddenly fall and get him to split into, into two, into four, that will turn into two. And later on, you see, not even years from Daniel, you see Alexander the Great, young man, goes into the power real fast, dies early, and kingdom is split to four generals, and later on, it's this, 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 uh, put together to two generals instead of four. The same story, the same thing, written 20 years apart from each other. So the Bible has a way of just putting things together in a way where history always supported it. History always backed it up, and after a while, it has lasted the test of time. No other article, no other written fact has had that information, have that substance all through the years, but the Bible. Plus, when you read it, don't you feel something in your stomach? Certain words you hear, don't they just ring inside of you? You can't even explain why you know it's true. You just know it's true. That's the breath of God that he breathed out of the book into us. So yeah, let's continue, please. Sir. Uh, you want to go first and I'm going to go second. You believers believe in Trinity. Can you explain what Trinity is? <laughs> and what's this Holy Spirit thing? <laughs> Go. Go for it. <laughs> On the first question, the Trinity, God said, let us make man. And in the 11th chapter of Genesis, he said, let's go down and find the language. So he was talking to somebody. So when he said, let us. <laughs> you go. So when he says, let us, the us is the Son and the Holy Ghost. So we say uh, Trinity, that means three. So God is three and one. He's sovereign, he's one God, but it's like he's wearing three different hats. The Father, the Father was in the Old Testament primarily. We, we learn about Jesus in the four gospels and the um, Holy Spirit what came in the day of Pentecost. But Jesus, the Son was always there. The Holy Spirit was always there. And so the Trinity was always there. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I just want to add on this Holy Spirit thing, as you say. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is that sound, that voice that you hear in the sound. It is that sight you see in that vision. It is that knowing that you know that you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, question. Give it up for Judy, yo. <laughs> um, I have a question for the unbelievers. <laughs> okay. So you have the opportunity to believe in a God who promises everlasting life in heaven and has, gives you unconditional love. Why wouldn't you want to believe in that? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> uh. Easy, Joe. Easy, Joe. <laughs> you guys don't have fun like we do. I like to party. I like to do other things with other people. <laughs> I don't have time to get up 9 a.m. Because I'm getting in from the club at 9 a.m. And then I don't like the way you guys look at me. You got the stink face because you don't like the way I dress. You don't like my makeup. You don't like the way I'm looking at him, him, and him. I, not my problem. I just walked in. I don't know why you're looking at me like that. Maybe you want to go to the club. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's, it's fun on this side. And in my head, when I get finished having fun, then I'm going to kind of 
see what you guys are doing because I know about heaven and I know I don't want to go to hell. So I'm going to do my thing and when I'm ready, probably when I'm ready to get married, have kids, blah, 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 I'll come over there and see what you guys are doing. <laughs> Can some believers straighten that rock, please? Somebody? I got like, I got like a line of people. <laughs> I got a, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm confused. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm good. You know, I make about $300,000 a year. I got two mansions. My family's good. Why do I got to believe in anything else? I'm good. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Is this like a just, y'all just attacking them? <laughs> Jeez. Um, so I have an answer. Um, the reason why I decide not to continue to believe is because I've seen so many Christians fall and so many Christians pray and ask for God for answers and they still haven't gotten nowhere. They still haven't gotten up. They still haven't received their blessing. So what makes me think that there is a God if you haven't received your blessing? It's getting hot. <laughs> it's getting hot. <laughs> Now, why do you even call on his name when things are bad if you don't even believe in him? Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm going to answer the question of the non-believer first. How do you know that I didn't get my blessing? Did you ask me? Did you know whether or not uh, last night I didn't even realize that I was gonna wake up the next day. If I wake up every day, isn't that within itself a blessing? If I could get up and toss my legs over the side of the bed, get up, go out to a job, isn't that itself within a blessing? So how did you know that I'm praying and not receiving the blessing? Did you ask? What are you looking at when you see me? So you can't say for sure that I didn't get a blessing or I'm praying and I'm not receiving. You non-believers think that every time you want something, it happens here and now, or you have the $300,000 and you have the house and you're, you know, you're good. Who promised you tomorrow? Mm. Are you gonna have that $300,000 tomorrow? And when you do go, what are you going how are you going to take it with you? Somebody going to write you a check and put it in there? How are you going to cash it? So you can't say for sure that I'm not blessed. If you don't understand your own blessing, what do you know about mine? Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, she said part of what I was going to say is, you're not promised tomorrow. You don't know what you're going to do the next day. And for me, my blessing is knowing that one, I have somewhere to go when I am down. I mean, you go to the club and you have fun for the moment and that four or five hours was great. But then when you go home on your own or when you do lose that $300,000 or when you're broken and you're down, what do you have? I know I have a church full of people I have the spirit of God with me always. I have a book I can open any day and it, it show me light on my, my situation. So just to know I have inner peace and I know that I will never be alone and I'll never be too far down mm -hmm. where they can pick me up, that's a blessing in itself. Mm -hmm. And I'll give up the club any day to know that I'll be happy eternally instead of four or five hours. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'd like to take a different approach to answering your question, and I would like to ask you to forgive me as a believer for not always living Jesus out loud the way I should. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you for, to forgive me for judging you when I am not the judge, God is. And God has already judged you um, worthy of his love and worthy of his, um, his gift of eternal life. 
And I would like to ask your forgiveness for making you believe that God was a sugar daddy. <laughs> I would like to ask you I, to forgive me for the snappy little phrases I used. I'm blessed, too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> I'd like to forgive you for living flippantly before you instead of honestly showing you that I struggle just like you mm -hmm. and that I'm tempted just like you and I have hard days just like you, but I have something that gets me through that is beyond anything this earth can promise. Mm -hmm. And that I have power through that Holy Spirit thing <laughs> that gives me a peace that the world can't copy. And so if you would forgive me, I would like to show you Jesus as best I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. forgot what it was. I'm sorry. Actually, Pastor Sharon kind of answered it because my next question is, why do you judge me? But she already answered it, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, this is kind of a two-part question. Um, you guys were talking about uh, unconditional love and going to heaven. I go on marches to stand for equality and, and, and justice and things like that. I donate my blood, give my time. They say I have like one of the kindest hearts, but um, I really don't believe in God. And then as far as love is concerned, from what you guys say, with all of that said, I'm not going to make it to heaven, but you guys are. So why does that separate us? Um, that's the first part. And um, why would I want to follow a God that wants everybody to praise him? Is he like so into himself that everyone needs to praise him all the time? <laughs> so his first question, why is being good not good enough, pretty much? Why? I feel like through everything that you're doing and all the good that you're doing, you don't know it, but God is already drawing you towards him because every action that you're doing is part of what he wants us to do. So if you feel as though we're going to heaven and you're not through everything that you're doing, you may not know that that's how he's pulling you towards him. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, in regards to your first part, you might be doing all these good things, but it's like if someone has a birthday and you buy them a gift, do you buy it out of obligation? Or do you buy it because you care about that person? I missed that. Okay, I have a question for the unbelievers. If there's no God, why do you believe in right and wrong? Yeah, you guys, this way. Yeah, you. If you don't believe in God, why is that right or wrong to you? <laughs> I'm gonna give you one of those answers. Because right is right and wrong is wrong. Nah, let's stay there. Because <laughs> that's what my mama told me. <laughs> Who said there is a right or wrong? Let's just do it. <laughs> so, I'm gonna add to that. So let's say, oh, sorry. I come into your house, and I tie your, family up to, tie your family up, and I kill everybody. Is that wrong? It's all relative. Huh? It depends. It depends? Yes. So I could, so I could do that, and it's fine. <laughs> if I do wrong, I see the cops coming towards me. I don't see God. I can't physically see him, but I can see the police officers when they're coming to lock me up. <laughs> Tangible evidence. <laughs> I, have, I have a different question, Aka. Uh, don't, don't burn me up for this. Uh, why did God sacrifice himself to himself so that he could correct a mistake that he made? Should I get on that? I'm like, hold up. Hold up. Hey, hey, anybody, anybody got it? I like that. That's good. Anybody? 
Any? Any? Believer? Nobody? Um, okay. Now I'm going to answer that. Just for fun, and I've never done this before, just for fun, I'm going to ask a visitor to answer that question. Mm. The guy in the suit in the back, why don't you stand up? Why don't you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> guy, no pressure. Guy, guy wearing a suit's got to have some answers, right? No pressure. <laughs> we don't normally do this. But, uh, <laughs> um, can the question be repeated again? Give me a mic. <laughs> But before I answer the question, what was the mistake that he made? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk. Let's talk. some mistake because the man had to die. You know, he killed himself for some reason. So, you know, why? I mean, it all ties around in service. Okay. Well, when, when Adam, when God created Adam, created, um, Adam was created in perfect fellowship with God. So through man's sin and disobedience, fellowship was broken. So throughout the Old Testament, there was sacrifices, burnt offerings, grain offerings, Day of Atonement, once a year, Yom Kippur, to make the blood was shed for the atonement, for the remission of sin. So every year, animals, all these animals was being sacrificed. But then the Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. The animals were okay, but God had a better plan. So Jesus came as the only one who walked the face of this earth perfect, died upon the cross, and his blood was shed, one shot deal, to bring us back into fellowship. As Paul says in Ephesians, that wall of separation mm -hmm. has been torn down. Man is back into the presence of God, that we don't have to go to the zoos and sacrifice animals. We can come into, we can receive Jesus Christ, believe his free gift, <laughs> that right. the blood was shed, and we can have eternal life. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was a setup, yo. Somebody gets it. <laughs> That's to set uh, you up. <laughs> this is Pastor Ty. <laughs> <laughs> and Pastor Ty, this is Chestnut Street, just so you know. <laughs> so, I want to add more to that if we go off, are we going off the topic or are we staying on the topic for a little bit? Uh, are, you, are, you going are we staying on the topic for a little bit? Are we going off or are we staying on the topic? Um, she don't Okay. You have more? Jacob? Is it with this or separate? I don't know. Huh? You don't? Okay, one second. Okay, full phone continue. Like, hear what he said, right, Jacob? The fact that God sent Jesus was because of a mistake. Remember, the Bible says that before he created earth, before that, the land was slain. So think about this process, right? There were no earth yet, no heaven yet, no man, nothing and the lamb was slain. That's a picture of love to the fact that he would decide and know, knowing what we would do, he would decide to have a remedy for your sin. That before you will sin, I have an answer for it, I have a cure. Way before you even do one act, you took care of it. So it wasn't a mistake, it was knowing how man would decide to walk away. That was the fact. That was the fact. Not that he messed up, so I gotta fix it now. It wasn't a linear thing. It was something that done before creation. It was eternal, eternity. So he knew everything, right? So he knew for sure that man will one day decide to walk away. And before they do, knowing that I wanna keep them and sustain them, had to be my image, I will make sure I take care of this sin before it comes. So it will not detour them from living out the purposes. I have for them. Because Adam sinned, right? And God let him live for 9 or 30 years after? Why? If he sinned, get rid of him. It's not over. How will he let him live on earth for that long? Because the plan that he will give every other mankind what God gave him. And God will discard somebody because they sin, because he knows that what's inside of you is so important that he will make sure he redeems that over and over and over. So before the first sin come to the earth, he said, I got it. I got it white out. 
fix this problem. <laughs> and he took care of it. <laughs> so that's why. That's why. Continue. Uh, yeah, you know, um, me and my boys, we, 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 we out there and uh, we had cats come talk to us and they said things like, you know, they, they schooled us on the point of fact that, you know, they called Abraham Ibrahim, you know, and, <laughs> you know, basically what they let, what they taught us, they taught us that, you know, that they, the, the question that they rose in us was that Jesus Christ was a prophet, right? Mm -hmm. So he was a prophet, but then the Christians, you Christians, y'all say that he was God too. And I'm like, okay, well, why would, first of all, why would God kill his prophet? And then, I had to go into character too. And then, why would God kill his prophet, right? Mm -hmm. And then, if he's God, how could he die? <laughs> Woo wee! Got the mic. <laughs> we got Rocky the back. Yeah. Jesus came down as a man. That's how he died, and he was killed by men, not by God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh huh. You got Effie in the back? Effie, right here? Yeah. God says in His Word, I create good and I create evil. Explain. Ooh, wee. Believers. God grace evil <clears throat> so that man can have a choice to not decide to pick evil. Everything that's in the world, God made, and he has a reason for it. All things we don't understand, but we have to believe and have faith in God. But God gives man a choice, and even he even helps man with that choice, because the Bible says that if no to come to Jesus, God the Father draws him. So even though God created evil, it's still that he gets more reverence from us when we turn down evil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My question to the non-believers is, um, since you don't believe in God, and you do know that believers do believe in God, when you look at Christians, what is it about us that you see that convinces you that, see, I don't need to believe in God? Look how that Christian is behaving. Or what is it that you see that makes you convinced you should continue to be a non-believer when you look at a Christian? Hmm. Got a lamb in the back. Well, y'all bury y'all sins like you don't have them. Ooh. <laughs> Basically, that's what I was going to say. What Joe said. I don't see a difference between you and me. Mm. <laughs> we good? Well, also, I mean, I see how you live your life. I see that you walk around claiming to be Christ-like but you're looking at me with judgment, so shouldn't he be the same thing? Why would I waste my time believing in something that doesn't make me feel accepted? <laughs> so what is it in that Christian you think needs to change to make a difference in whether or not you believe in God? Let's find a solution, everybody. I think if more Christians would be a little more honest and stop putting up a front about how they live, 
and just share their life for real, the bad, the good, and the ugly, maybe I could believe in it. Mm. Mm. You said you believe in God and all that he provides for you, so why don't you give me what you got and let God provide for you? God accepts me as I am, then um, how come you don't accept um, the LGBTQ community? And because um, it reminds me of how Christians were back in the day in the 60s, not accepting the blacks in the civil rights movement. <laughs> That's a tough one. Speaking for myself as a Christian, when I was growing up, I supported the black movement, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I grew up around a lot of gay people in the gay community in the village, New York City. And I never had a problem with any of them. And in my heart, I believe in Jesus, and I believe in the rights and freedom of all mankind. Let's, let's add to that, while we're here. Oh, go ahead. God says each man and woman will be saved by his own belief. Um, I don't have any problems with anybody because God is the one that's going to judge us all, not us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's add to that the same thought we on already. Is every homosexual person going to hell? These are the believers, obviously. To the screen, is it? Oh. As a Christian, it's not my job to say if you're going to hell or not. As a mm -hmm. Christian, it's my job to love on you as you are and pray for your salvation. Mm -hmm. So I cannot answer if every homosexual person is going to hell. There you go. That's Good what answer. my pastors taught me. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> There's not a hotter topic, more relevant topic than this. Mm -hmm. So what sends you to hell is not your sexuality. Mm -hmm. What sends you to hell is not accepting Christ as your savior. So if you kind of cut through all that, and we are called as believers to love every human being. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you are. Our job. Our function upon the face of the earth is to love every human being. So I don't care what your sexual preference is, I'm called to love you. Judgment comes with God. Ju God judges, I don't judge you. Mm -hmm. My job is to love you enough to make you look into my life and make you jealous of my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So my job is to love you more than you've ever been loved in your entire life and to show you unconditional love. And once you see unconditional love, you're going to say this, Man, I don't get that. I don't get your God, but whatever you've got, I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Oh, wow. More hands fill up. <laughs> Just pick. <laughs> Yo, I'm a five time OG. I send these young dudes out to murder for me. And uh, they sell drugs for me, they do whatever I tell them to do. If I want them to knock over a store, take everything they got, or take out a whole family, they do what I say. But, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, Christian, you Christians tell me that God will still forgive me. Why would he forgive somebody like me? Why, why would he care about me? Is that, that's crazy. I'm like his enemy. So how, who, who go around making loved ones out their enemy? <laughs> what was that? Can I be loved? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not that eloquent, just work with me. Um, yes, you're a non-believer, however, God still loves us all. He created us, created us all. Um, and if he didn't love you, he wouldn't let you, you know, wake up every morning, have sight, 
have people to talk to around you. He would just remove you. So um, he does love you and you are worthy of getting his love. It's really up to you to open up your heart and your mind to him because he gave us free will and us believers decided to be on his side. So at the end of the day, it's really up to you up to you. Whatever you choose, that's your decision, but just know that he's waiting for you, and no matter how many bad stuff you've done, he will still love you at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. 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 I'd like to say that there is this wonderful thing called grace, and God mm-hmm. says that there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from his love. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, how do I get this grace? How do I get this love? How do, how do I get this? What, what, what's good? Walk me. Show me something. I know how to go get that dough on the block. I know how to go handle this handle. But how do I get this? Hmm. This thing you're talking about. <laughs> Somebody's present the gospel plan. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is, one... I need you because there are a lot of people who want to find their way too. And if you were one of us, you might be the person to connect to them. Mm. So I have this great family up there that I want to introduce you to (laughs) and they can help you get there. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) All right. Hey guys, I used to go to church, right? And I was... (laughs) I was very active, you know, Easter stuff, kids stuff. I mean, I was into it, you know, and you guys taught me how to pray. You guys taught me about Jesus. You taught me how to ask and I shall receive, knock and the door shall be answered, you know. And then one day, someone close to me dies. And you tell me, I tell you, you know, you told me to pray. You told me to pray and and believe in healing. But then the person close to me dies. And all you have to say to me is, well, that's God's will. How do you expect me to believe in that type of God that killed someone that I love, but healed someone that you knew? Wow. And then you can talk. Wow. Well, whoever said that the person who died isn't healed when they go to heaven? Good answer. Oh, solid. Well, speaking from experience, I can say that God always still wants us to pray no matter what. He wants you to believe in healing and believe in uh, that he's still God, even if he doesn't do things the way we think he should do them. When God does something, he does something for the best of that person because he's always looking for the he was looking at the love that he has for us. It's always in God's best interest why he does what he does. And who's to say that person didn't need rest? Mm. Amen. I mean, if God created everything on earth, why can I not smoke weed? I mean, it's, it's all, it came from the ground <laughs> and it's legal in certain states. I'm just saying.
we are also to be out there. We'll be fine, I know. I understand. I want to preach too, trust me. But I don't care about that. So go ahead. I didn't have a response to but can I ask you more question? Because I, I was at a party with Joe, right? Remember that party with Joe? I was there, Bo was there, he was trying to give me a job. It was all good. And then, um, so I saw this girl, right? And, and I tried to ask her out, but then she said we couldn't be together because I don't believe in God. That's what I like about it. Why got tripped?
So if I want another other believer, imagine them. Imagine them. They have no clue. And they're so busy through their glasses, through the news, and social media. They have questions. They have questions. So it's not too much for us to come together as a church and begin to recharge ourselves. Times are changing. Times are changing. And the whole idea of this, the end goal of this, in my mind, if it happened, it may not happen. I don't know. Is to one day be able to have a group that you yourself decide to go. I'm not going to make you. You want to come and come. If you don't, you don't. And we will go out. And we will have a sign that says, whatever you want to ask God, ask me. This is my hand goes for this, my mind. I have anybody ask you a question, and you are prepared. You're ready to answer. Because people will ask you questions. Tell them to pray for them, let them be asked easy. But tell, tell them to ask me whatever you ask God, they will stop. They will stop. And in those moments, we can begin to use to change lives little by little. But before we get out there, I want us to be ready here. So it's not a race, it's not a time frame, let's go outside. Whenever we are ready, and those who decide to come, we will go. If you want to stay back, it's okay. No pressure. It's on the person. It's on the person. This is the idea. We will do what's not going on. We will announce it each month. The very Wednesday it will be, so you know in advance when it's coming up. For the first one, we made a test, and it will be in about two weeks or so. We'll start this. Let's please stand, I'll pray, and we'll go ahead. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for being able to uh, reach us when you did, Father God. Allow us to enter into your kingdom, Lord God, and having share our hearts with one another, and having you be here, Father, and this God that leads us through these tough questions, and also how to view the unbeliever, how to see the believer, Father God, and when we live life, when we see each other, Father, and knowing that you are there, and doing it together, Father God, and you have a purpose in mind. And Lord God, we get together, and we learn, and we have, uh, we are equipped to, to give an answer, Father God, and you will have your way with, with, with us, and you'll be with this church, you'll be with the individuals, Father God, you will have us all be in a place where we are all ready to go out and be your soldiers, Father God, wherever we are. So Jesus, watch with us today, prepare our minds, keep us excited, we feel right now, Father God, that it may even never die off through the week, Father. Jesus, we pray, Lord God. Amen. Amen.